welcome to today's broadcast. I'm Mark Baker, and we're going to continue talking about the subject, the God of this world. In the previous few broadcasts, we've introduced the subject, we begin to look at some things, talk about some things, looking at Satan as the God of this world, and we saw that the world, the word world, translated in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, should, is more accurately translated age. Living from the carnal realm puts us in his domain. We're going to jump in today. We've laid some foundation, and if you haven't been with us, I encourage you to go back and look at the first three broadcasts in the series. We don't have time to go over everything, but before we start, I want to thank our partners. You are coming alongside of us, just as Caleb and Joshua came alongside Moses and lifted up his arms. Working together, we are seeing this ministry grow. We're seeing, you know, the number of people being reached increase. And all of us together will receive an equal reward in heaven. And that's why I tell you, our desire is not just to, you know, for you to give a financial offering, but our desire is to see fruit abounding to your account. And we're doing this together. I get the testimonies. We look at the, you know, we look at the outreaches. We look at the number of people being reached, the doors that are being opened. And it's you, our partners, that are enabling us to take it, to pursue everything that God is calling this ministry to do. Before we get started, if you have not yet joined us in partnership, we're believing God to increase the number of people giving them a financial basis because that forms the foundation. There are a number of things God has asked us to do, and it takes money to do this. I've heard ministers say that over the years, but as we see, you know, this ministry grow, we're seeing, you know, the truth of that statement. But all of us together, some of you are giving $5 a month, some are 50, some are giving $100 a month, all of it coming together enables us to to fulfill the vision God has given us for MBBDM Ministries. So let me, before we get started in today's broadcast, let me go ahead and pray over your scene, and then we'll jump in and see what the Holy Spirit has for us today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for each of our monthly partners. I thank you for those who have committed to stand with us in prayer. I thank you for those who have committed to stand with us with a financial offering each month. And I thank you for those who have just chosen by the leading of the Spirit, just to give a one-time financial gift to this ministry. You see their hearts, Lord. The value of the gift cannot be measured in the amount, and we just speak blessings over their families, over their houses. Satan, in the name of Jesus, I command you to take your hands off their finances. I release the ministering angels to go forth and cause increase to come into their households. Holy Spirit, I thank you for teaching them, guiding them, leading them, and I thank you for blessing them. I thank you that each of us, Father, are in this together and that you don't see one as being above the other. All of us together, but our prayer partners, those who are giving financial monthly offerings and those who are giving one-time financial offerings, all of us are in this together in every soul, every spirit touched through MB Media Ministries is credited to all of our accounts equally. And I thank you for those who are viewing this, that you're just causing fruit to abound to their eternal counts, and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to get started. Let's start in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll just pick up in verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience, in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthland vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not us. So when we look at this, Paul refers to Satan as the God, little g, of this age. 
we've already seen that the you know when we say world we're, it's more accurately translated age until Jesus comes back and establishes the millennial kingdom Satan is in charge in the natural realm this is why it's so important for us as Christians to learn to live from the Spirit, because our spirits have been redeemed, our spirits have been recreated, our spirits have been made new in Christ Jesus. But far too many of us are living from the outer realm. Why? What is Satan's number one goal? I've heard people say, well, he wants to possess this, he wants to get a body, he wants this and that and the other. But he knows that the gospel according to 1 Peter 1, 23, is God's incorruptible seed. And according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it is the power of God. You kind of get a hint to that in verse 7, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, where it says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of power may be of God, not of us. What is the treasure he's talking about? He's talking about the knowledge of the glory of God, which we see in verse 6. When that word of knowledge in the Greek pictures a knowledge gained in personal relationship, knowledge gained through intimacy with our Creator. What is Satan's goal? We, we see this in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, where he says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, should, who is the image of God, should shine on them. He knows that as long as he can keep a people, a person, operating according to their natural senses, the five physical senses, they're going to be in his domain. They're not going to be able to exercise the authority that Jesus has granted them. So his goal is to keep us operating from the natural. Let me read something that the Holy Spirit gave us in the program that aired on August 9th. He said, we struggle because we do not understand. We struggle because carnally minded we become. We've tuned to the natural realm, trying to walk in spiritual truth. We're tuned to the events of this world. We're tuned into our natural life. We have the pressures of work. We have deadlines. We have things pressing against us, and our attention is drawn outward. Did not the Spirit tell us to be mindful of the distractions, trying to pull our attention away from the things of the Spirit? Did not the Spirit tell us to be mindful of these things? But we do not look within. We look without to understand the things of the Spirit. But a tuning fork he has given us in our natural tongue. So what he's talking about here is we struggle trying to understand the things of God. It shouldn't be such a struggle. And I struggle, you know, in my early years trying to figure out God, trying to this and that and the other. What I've discovered, friend, is if we just set aside time to be with him, close our eyes and say, Holy Spirit, this is what I do. Just, what would you like to talk about today? Spend time meditating in the Word. The Word contains the incorruptible seed. The printed Word is the perfect representation of the Word of God, but it doesn't become the Word, the revelation, until it gets down into our spirit. Let me show you the process. Paul kind of shows us this in Romans chapter 10. Now, I'm sure if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you've probably heard somebody say, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. We've made it almost formularic where if you just hear enough of the Word, if you just hear enough messages, you're going to get faith. Well, I taught that in my early years. I heard that. And the problem was I would listen to a lot of messages, read a lot of Scripture, but it didn't seem like faith was working my heart. It wasn't until the Holy Spirit took me to Romans chapter 12 and verse 3 and showed me that God has given to each one of us the measure of faith. He took me to first, Second Peter chapter 1, which says that I have the same like faith as Peter, the apostles did. You, if you made Jesus the Lord of your life, friend, have the exact same faith that God has. So if we have the measure of faith, and we have the exact same faith that Peter or the apostles walked in, why are we exercising it? Why do we need it to come? Let's back up from verse 17. Let's look at the chapter and see what exactly Paul is telling us here, because it goes right along with what the Holy Spirit was telling us in that program that aired on August 9th. We'll start in verse 6. It says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise, 
Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, thou shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So we hear the, the word is nigh you. First it is in your mouth, and then it is in your heart. So the challenge here is a lot of people have taken this and turned it into a formula. If I just confess, if I confess. But he's not talking about us becoming a parrot. We're not confessing to, manif to bring manifestation. Notice he says, first it's in our mouth, and then it's in our heart. We hear with the ear. We receive into the soul. The seed begins to work. We water it with our tongue. We pray in the utterances given by the Spirit. The Spirit leads us. He guides us. Under that supernatural watering, that seed begins to blossom. It enters the soul through the ear gates. It enters the soul through the eye gates. We look at it. We see it. We hear it. But then we meditate. We pray. We fellowship. He has given us a tuning fork, as he has said so many times, a tuning fork that is our tongue. We yield to the utterances of the Spirit. We begin to speak forth the mysteries. Our minds are blinded because we are not yielding. We are not yielding in prayer. We are not speaking forth those utterances. We feed it into our soul. We look at the Word, but we do not take it any further. For many, many have been baptized with the Spirit. Many have received him within, but they do not exercise the gifts he has given. They do not spend the time. Yes, they may have a few minutes here or a few minutes there praying in tongues, but did not the Spirit show us? Paul received his revelation by praying much in tongues. As he told the Corinthian believers, he prayed more than they all. We look at the wisdom, we look at his letters and stand amazed. All revelation has been given. We are not seeking something new. We are seeking a revelation of the hidden mysteries contained within the Word. For He has given it all. He has given it all. We learn to yield. We learn to look to Him. But in doing so, we must learn to yield. For it is hearing with the ear that brings the Word to our souls. But for it to move from our soul down into our spirits, we must yield to the Spirit. We must become tuned to the Spirit. For those who walk according to their natural senses have dull spiritual hearing. They are unable to hear the things of the Spirit because they are not tuned in. But the choice is in our hands alone. We choose to tune or we choose to push away. Many, many are crying out to God. Many are crying out for him to speak, but he is speaking, but they are just not tuned. We need to look to the Spirit. We need to ask him for help, for he is waiting and he will guide and he will lead. But first, we must learn to look to him. So many ignore him. So many don't look to him until they have a need. But he wants to be your best friend. He wants to have fellowship. He wants to spend time. It doesn't matter whether the sky is blue or dark, look, whether the clouds of a major storm are overhead. He wants to be there at all times. He wants you to spend time with him in good times and bad, but far too many of us look to him only when the storm clouds become dark. They look to him only when things are amiss. We struggle. We struggle to receive because we're not looking to him. Fellowship is something we do not seek. We must acknowledge him, for he lives within. When we made Jesus the Lord of our life, we believed in our heart, we confessed with our mouth. The Holy Spirit entered into us. He baptized us into the body of Christ and then sealed us with himself. He is not going anywhere, just as the Master said. He will be with us always. But the choice is ours to seek to him. The choice is ours to look within. Those who look without, those who spend their time focused on the natural things, such as the news, their sporting events, their television programs, and their movies, will be dull of hearing. And in the, when the storms come, they will be unable to receive.
because they have not practiced or tuned themselves within. But in his mercy, he will help them. You can turn to him, no matter the situation. He is there. He will help. But the seed must be planted and given time to grow. In his mercy, miracles do come. But the miracles are not what we are called to lean on. The miracles are only a temporary measure to give the seed time to grow. If we are not planting the seed, if we are not meditating, if we are not fellowshipping, that seed will not grow. And then we will find ourselves in a continuous loop of running to him for miracle after miracle after miracle. But this is not the way we were designed to live. We were designed to live in communion with our Heavenly Father. Did not the Master tell us that eternal life is to know him, to have that intimate relationship with him? We learn to look to him. We learn to look in the times of fellowship. We receive the word into our soul. We pray out the hidden mystery, just as Paul tells us. We pray that out. We pray it out with our tongue. Revelation comes, first in the form of thoughts, in the form of ideas. These are the way the Holy Spirit speaks to us. He comes to us. He takes his desires and plants them within us. His desires become our desires as we learn to delight in him. We find balance because we found fellowship, for fellowship is the foundation of it all. We operate from that realm of the Spirit because we operate from him. Friend, as we're moving forward, we keep seeing this common theme, fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. The Holy Spirit was not just sent to give us you know, an emotional experience in church. He was not just sent to manifest miracles. He was not just sent to cause people to fall down in service or run. I'm not saying that manifestations necessarily are bad things, but we've taken it to an excess. We become extremely carnal in the church. We're looking outward, trying to get manifestations instead of looking to him. I have actually found when people look to him, manifestations actually occur in greater measures. There are spiritual laws, and many people have activated those spiritual laws, some by accident. They see things happening. They see manifestations. Some people are touched. But when you look at it, the majority are not. You see people have an emotional experience of physical manifestation week after week, but where's the permanent change? Because they don't seek him. We go on and looking at this process, in verse 11, Romans chapter 10 and verse 11, for it says, For the scripture said, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How they sh- shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except to be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith the Lord who has believed our report. Notice it says that in verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? The purpose of these messages, the reason the Holy Spirit anoints us to teach, the reason he anoints your pastor to teach, or other ministers you may sit on, is so that you can hear. The interesting thing was earlier in the program, I talked about Romans chapter 10, 17, which we're going to jump into here. The word hear that is used in verse 14 is a different Greek word than verse 17. They're connected, they're, you know, they're related But the word, when it says, how should they believe in whom they have not heard, is talking about the outer ear. It's a hearing in the external that moves inward. On the other hand, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, the word heard is talking about hearing with the inner ear, and then it moves outward. So what he is saying is, before faith can come, we have to hear with our outer ears. We cannot hear without messages, without preachers. You see, back then, they didn't have the written word. You know, one of the things I observed today is one of the best, one of the greatest blessings we have 
is an amount of messages. I mean, literally on YouTube alone, you can find millions of messages to listen to. At the same time, one of the greatest curses we have is the number of messages that are available. People become distracted because they're listening to message after message after this one, that one. Oh, we found this one. We got to listen to this one. It's almost like this endless hamster wheel of trying to get to the right messages and this and that. You need to be led by the Spirit of God. Not every message is the right message for you. Have you ever heard someone say, oh, this message really blessed me? And then you listen to it and you're like, what are they listening to? The reason it blessed them was because the Spirit anointed it for them. The reason it did not bless you was because it was not anointed for you. It doesn't mean it was wrong. It just means it was not anointed for you. How do you know what to be listening to? By spending time in fellowship. It all comes back to fellowship. That's what the Spirit is telling us. You know, we struggle because we didn't understand. We struggle because carnally minded we become. We're tuned to the natural realm trying to walk in spiritual truth. You can't live your entire life in the natural realm looking at natural input, you know, the news all day, listening to your secular music. You know, even Christian music a lot of times is not filled with the Word of God. I am surprised so many times how many times I've been in different services at different churches and hearing, you know, the worship songs. You see people lifting their hands and worshiping God, and I'm thankful for that. But if you listen to what they're saying, a lot of times it's not even scripturally based. You are the guardian of your soul, friend. You are the guardian. And as the guardian, you're the one who chooses what's allowed through your eyes and through your ears. And you need to understand that Satan is the God of this world. His goal is to clog up your mind, to clog up your soul, so that the word cannot penetrate into your heart. We can see this in Mark chapter 4, and we don't have time in this program today, in the parable of the sower. You know, three different types of ground. Each one of those types is, you see where Satan comes in to keep the word from taking root, keep the word from getting active. In fact, in that parable, we see that, you know, persecutions, trials, troubles, situations come against us for the word's sake. I have heard people say that as you grow in your revelation of God, that you will see your troubles start decreasing. But I found the opposite to be true, because Satan wants to distract you from the Word. Now, I've also found with the troubles, with the increase in attacks against the Word and the, that I've been receiving in Revelation, I'm also finding it that it's becoming easier and easier to overcome things. There's still some things. I'm not saying, you know, we're necessarily spiritual dying. There's still some things we're walking out, we're struggling. But as we grow in his in revelation of him, as we spend time with him, it becomes less and less an effort. And friend, I get it when things are coming against you. You know, you may have a condition in your body, the symptoms are screaming at you constantly. You still have a choice of what you're looking at. You're, and when we talk about this, we're not talking about denial. I've heard people teach, oh, just deny the situation. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what you're choosing to look at, feed on, meditate, think upon. Are you choosing to look at the Word, or are you choosing to look at your symptoms? It really comes down to that. So we see in Romans chapter 10 that it begins with hearing with the outer ear. We hear the Word of God. We hear the messages. We hear the written Word, you know, maybe on an audio tape. We're hearing with our outer ear. Notice it said in, you know, verse 8, the word begins in our mouth and then in our heart. What's happening? We're hearing. In this case, we become the preacher when we read Scripture, when we're meditating Scripture. We become the preacher. We're preaching the word. We're speaking the word. The problem with confession, in Proverbs eighteen twenty one, it tells us that life and death is in the power of the tongue. The problem with confession is we've made it out you know, almost like we're going to become parrots, parroting the word, parroting the word, just speaking it, speaking it, speaking it, speaking it, and just say it enough, we'll get a manifestation. You need to understand, friend, confession is a very valid thing to the Christian. In fact, in Hebrews, we see that Jesus is the high priest of our profession, or confession is what the Greek says. 
if we're not confessing, he has nothing to be high priest over. But the purpose of confession is not, you know, like waving a magic wand to cause things to come to us. We're confessing the word to plant it in our soul. And then we water it by praying in the language God gives us. We pray it out, pray that wisdom out, we speak it. You need to understand, friend, the things you are hearing are affecting you much more than you or I can even begin to imagine. They affect the condition of our soul. What we're feeding into our eyes, what we're feeding into our ears, these things are affecting us. They are causing change in our soul. The question is, what are we going to be doing with the Word? It is important to have your, you know, different scriptures as the Spirit quickens them, that you, you know, you look at them, you speak them, you talk to them. And as you do that, as you fellowship with them, as you spend that time with them, then we come to verse 17. And you notice that the hearing with the outer ear is first. And then we come to verse 17, Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We hear with our outer ear. We feed it into our soul. We meditate on it. We confess it to feed it into our soul. It becomes a cycle. We're talking. And then in Romans chapter 10, 17, when it says faith cometh by hearing, it's talking by hearing with the inner ear. That word begins to take root. And all of a sudden we hear it inside. Have you ever had a moment when you're studying scripture, you're looking at things and all of a sudden you get this aha moment? That's what I'm talking about. When it says faith cometh, it's talking from the inside out. Faith that measure of faith within you. It, when you hear and it becomes revelation knowledge, it begins to flow outward, causing the power of God to come into manifestation in the world around us. That's when faith cometh. Well, friend, we are out of time today, and as we close out this program, let me encourage you once again, you can live life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.